But if you only know how to behave, you're just a domesticated house cat or, or a lap dog. Yeah. You, have to be, you have to push beyond the persona, and that's what the integration of the shadow does from the Jungian perspective. It's like to pull that monster that's been edited out of you, to pull that back in and to allow that to reveal itself within your, within your increasingly sophisticated way of being. And then you're not just a persona. So if you want to push back on your persona, uh, are you saying that you have to cultivate your dark, uh, your shadow? Is that yeah, the, well, the premier of, path? Yeah, yeah, because the thing is, you can't, you can't escape from your persona unless you can say no. I, here's, an, here's an example from popular culture. Um, in the Harry Potter series, Harry Potter is obviously the hero of the story. But he's touched by malevolence, right? The only reason he can stand up against evil is because there's some evil in him that, yeah. that he's incorporated, essentially. Yeah. Well, that's exactly right. And that the persona, that, that if you're a persona, then you're an obedient citizen. But the problem with being an obedient citizen is that if the society tells you to march the Jews off to the death camp, for example, and you're obedient, then that's what you'll do. And it doesn't, it isn't like society is civilized and then all of a sudden you're performing some act of atrocity. That isn't how it works. It's like, you're, you're obedient citizen and then you're asked to violate your conscience a little bit. Yeah. And you, you have to because you, you don't have anything other than that persona. And so, and that's obedience. And so, a little more obedience is demanded and you say, okay, well, and then you're a little bent like, because the society is becoming a little bent. And then you're a little weaker. And then the, you're asked to violate your conscience a little bit more and you think, well, there's a little less of me and the pressure's on a little more and I could have said no before, but I didn't. So you say yes again. Then you say yes again, and then, and then you have a society where one third of the population is informing on the other two thirds. Yeah. It's hell. It's like, well, so how do you say no? Well, that's the shadow. It's like, and that's, see, the reason that the video I did when, about Bill C-16 and its compelled speech provisions went viral was because I said no. I didn't say it casually. What I meant was, there isn't anything that you can do to me that I can imagine that will force me to utter the words that you want me to utter. Nothing. And I meant it. And when I made the video, I think people could actually tell that I meant it. And so I took this abstract problem yeah. and made it concrete. I said, no, that's not happening. And so, and that's part of the incorporation of the shadow. But in this regard, the shadow is actually benevolent, not malevolent. Well, once it's incorporated, yeah, yeah well, that's the thing. Yeah. And, and, and I don't know what to make of that in its entirety, because it, it sort of means that if you, it means something like, because one of the old metaphysical problems is why would God allow evil into the world? I think, well, maybe God didn't allow evil into the world. Maybe God allowed the possibility of evil into the world. That's different. And maybe the world with the possibility of evil is actually a better world than the world without the possibility of evil. It's something like that, you know, in, in that maybe a man is better when he's a dangerous man who's being good than he would be if he was just a good man who wasn't capable of being dangerous. And I believe that because the best men that I've ever met are very dangerous men. Yeah. You don't mess with them. Yeah. So, and you know that as soon as you meet them. Do you think weak men can be virtuous? Because, no. Because I think that when you're weak, let's say that signals that you don't have the options to sin. Right. Which is something that creates resentment, and resentment creates corruption. Mm -hmm. So in this sequence, do you think that someone without teeth or without the options to sin can be... Can, can be, be good. See, that's a, that's a real theological question, right? Because the question you're asking is, and this is tied up with the idea of free will and evil, can a person who doesn't have the option to be evil be good? And I would say no. So maybe that's the reason that, metaphysically speaking, yeah. you know, and I don't know where you are when you're speaking metaphysically exactly, but the question of why is there evil in the world is a constant question. It's like, it's possible that without the possibility of evil, there cannot be good. Good requires the possibility of evil. And, and maybe good is so good that the fact that it requires the possibility of evil is acceptable. Maybe it's even desirable. I mean, you know, you, you kind of end, end up on the edge of your knowledge when talking about such things, but it seems to me to be right. Yeah. And it, and it seems to me right, be right in a lived sense, you know, like, um, 
I met Jocko Willink, he's a good example. I mean, Willink was the commander in Ramadan, I think. And, you know, you can say what you want about American military involvement. It has nothing to do with that, really. Not, not at this level of analysis. He's a tough guy. I follow him on Twitter. Yeah, so you know. He, he gets up every morning at 5.30, exactly. 4.30. He's, he's a tough guy. He's a, he said, he told me quite straightforwardly, that he was one of those kids that as an adolescent could have gone either way, right? Yeah. He could have been highly successful street criminal. Yeah, probably. Right? But he, yeah, probably. Well, you can see it. But he decided not to do that. And, you know, he's very, I would say he's... He was a SEAL, right? Mm -hmm, that's yeah. right. And he's psychophysiologically intimidating. He's a big guy. Yeah. You can tell he knows how to use it. And you can tell he used it. Yeah. But as far as I can tell, he's a good person. And that's actually, all of that capacity for mayhem is part of what makes him a good person. Yeah. And people know that. That's why they're listening to him. Yeah. And that, like I said, the other people I've met who, the men I've met who are good men, they're all like that. They're all dangerous. They're all dangerous. Yeah. Have they all been not good men before? Or is that not part of becoming a good man? I would say they've certainly all done things that they, that... Well, you know, adolescents break rules, right? And healthy adolescents break rules. And so then the question is, well, how extreme does the rule breaking become? Well, it would vary from person to person, but I would say that most of them, not all of them, but most of them were more on the end of the rule breaking spectrum, right? They broke more rules than normal, but they clued in, you know, and decided, explored that and then decided, no, that's, yeah. that's not, that's better than cowardice. Yeah. It's better than weakness, but it's not as good as what's good. Yeah. So if you follow this doctrine, actually the people that are accusing you of instantiating like toxic masculinity, well, let's say that it's true that you're, that you're um, promoting uh, male strength. Mm -hmm. If you follow Masculine this doctrine, strength. Yeah, ma well, yeah, well, sorry, it's, yeah, well, sorry, it's yeah. important because I, I'm also promoting it in women. Yeah. You know, like my daughter's a good example, man. She's tough, you don't yeah. mess with her. She'll cut you apart. Yeah, <laughs> I believe you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Maybe it was wrongly phrased. Then. No, no, it's okay. No, but the thing, what I'm trying to get is that when you're telling people to empower themselves. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't say that because I'd never use that word. Empower? <laughs> I hate that uh, word, oh, well. but it's okay. To become I'm stronger. encouraging people. Yeah. I like that word better because yeah. I'm encouraging people. Yeah. You know, to put courage into them. That's better. Yeah. So by becoming courageous, you increase your potential for being virtuous. Mm -hmm. That's basically... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and I, I, one of the most amazing things that I discovered this year, or stumbled upon, was I was puzzling over a line in the New Testament, which I've always been curious about, because it never sat right with me. The meek shall inherit the earth. And so I was, as, as I said before, if you go online, Bible Hub, I think it's called, Bible Hub, it's really good for this because it, it contains a collection of commentaries, so you can look and at a verse. And, right? yeah, yeah. You, yeah, you can look at a verse and know the translations, multiple translations, and multiple commentators. So yeah. each verse is taken apart by many, many people. And I found out that the word meek, meek either doesn't mean now what it meant when people first translated the text, or it was a mistranslation, either way. But because meek so sounds like powerless and harmless, it's something like that, right? But what meek actually means, it's the derivation of a word, it's the translation of a word that meant something more like those who have swords and know how to use them but keep them sheathed. I thought, oh yes, that's exactly it. The world, uh, the, those who have swords and know how to use them but choose to keep them sheathed will inherit the world. It's like, yes, exactly right, exactly right. Much different than the idea of Quite meek. different, mm -hmm. quite different. I think... This is a good point and a good note to close this I off. I agree. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Nice talking with you. Same, same.